Hey there, Brambling. It's Uncle Luke here. Now, today on the podcast, I've actually got a very special guest. Her name is Minoji Gamaralalage. Minoji and I actually went to middle school and high school together. She was always one of the most pleasant and kind people to be around. We also did a vocal jazz class together, and that is where we shared a common interest in singing and music. Now today, Minoji and I are actually going to be diving deep into the topic of identity as a whole. Now, identity is a very nuanced and complicated and important topic to be talking about, and we try our absolute best to try to really encapsulate what it means to have your own sense of identity. All I'm going to say when it comes to editing this conversation is that it really felt like I was mining for gold, and I am so grateful to have had the chance to really work on this and to really dig for that gold. So thank you so much, Minoji. Now, some cool things about Minoji Gamaralalage is that she is a health science, wellness, and education advocate. She graduated from Simon Fraser University with a Bachelor of Science studying molecular biology, biochemistry, and psychology minor. She also has a Bachelor of Science at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, and she was also a post-secondary education inclusion facilitator at Simon Fraser University as well. Now, the first half of this conversation is going to be mostly Minoji and I catching up a little bit. Minoji is going to be telling us a little bit about her story and then how our stories link up. And then the second half of this conversation is where we're going to get really into that topic. Now, I should have you all know that this conversation did have to get separated into two parts. So this is the first part and make sure to stay tuned for the second part, which will be coming up fairly soon. Yeah, I just wanted to extend my gratitude gratitude and thanks to Minoji for having this conversation with me. I really do appreciate it, and I think that there is a lot of value in what we were talking about, and I hope that those who are listening do find some value in this conversation. And so without any further ado, let's dive right into that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm really glad that we had a chance to chat beforehand. So yeah, um, just a little bit. Yeah. Nice to catch up a little bit. Yeah. It's so lovely to have you on this little podcast of mine for my nephew. I know that you've listened to some of the other episodes in the past, which I'm super honored that you would take the time to listen to that. Of course. Uh, so this is another, you know, first with you. Yeah. You know how we've done our little like music video sort of session with up last summer so this yeah, is another yeah. sort of milestone i would say so i'm honored and uh wow yeah, yeah. oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm so honored thank you um and I'm, I'm so excited to have you on this episode i i can tell that you're, you're gonna have so much to say so much wisdom to share so but before we begin i was just wondering if you'd want to take 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you can, as long as you need. I was just wondering if you'd want to tell me a bit of your story, if you're down, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm a 29 year old woman. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is accurate or not, if I'm second generation Canadian. Some papers are saying that, that if you were born in Canada, you're considered second generation because like your parents would be first generation if they're immigrants. Oh, okay. I'm not yeah. sure entirely. And also another colleague of mine really emphasized that point that, oh, you, you know, if you were born in Canada and your parents immigrated to Canada, like you're second generation. Okay. And she had to confirm all these details for her master's project. So I'm going to just go by that. So I'm a second generation Sri Lankan Canadian. And uh, yeah, I was born in Montreal. I never really had a chance to visit Eastern Canada, let alone Montreal yet. And I would love to do that at some point. Very early on, I moved to Sri Lanka for about 10 months. At one point before starting my schooling, learned how to speak Sinhalese very fluently. <laughs> That's my parents' mother tongue. 
I have like some random vivid memories of my time there, actually, even though at that time, you know, as a toddler, you, you would go undergo infantile amnesia, right? Like you would have no memory, really no recollection other than what people tell you based off of the photos you see, right? But I do remember catching fireflies. <laughs> so, uh-huh. Yeah, it's such a vivid memory for me. I remember catching fireflies uh, with my sister and I guess one of our older cousins on my dad's side. And then, of course, like, you know, letting them free. Yeah. And just kind of like the emotions that came with that, you know, just like, oh, my God, there's something that's so bright and like vivid. Like I've never seen a firefly before. And I was what, maybe three plus at yeah. that time. And in contrast to the like pitch black sky, right, it was just so dark. Once you're past 6 p.m., like it just goes dark so quickly because mm-hmm. you're very close to the equator. Yeah, I just remember thinking, what what are these creatures? It was cool to see a couple of them in a jar together. And this, you know, obviously, like, brings back memories of Owl City's Firefly. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then the kind of relief that came with having them released, you know? And I I don't know. It was just almost like a preface in a way in terms of how I saw myself, like this sort of like Firefly navigating like the backdrop of the darkness, the unwritten story of my life that's supposed to be unfolding. I don't know when, (laughs) I guess now, (laughs) even now. And then, yeah, so after that was probably 1996. And then then we moved back to uh, Canada and this time permanently relocated in BC. Guess throughout my childhood, for the most part, we've been moving about everywhere. At one point we were in East Vancouver and then Knight Street, Victoria, and then New Westminster for the longest time, Mm -hmm. I think for 15, 16 years uh, before moving to Coquitlam and then Surrey now. Relocating from one place to another, I felt like I was kind of on autopilot. There were still, of course, you know, growing up we had some good ties with family friends. And to this day, we are only really in touch with just one of the family friends, but that's life, right? And I think in New Westminster though, that was where I felt like I was starting to feel, oh, I feel like I belong, you know? In relating history of moving around, I kind of see that um, motion of going from different points of my life, different stages in my like career, professional life, as well as this series of transformations too towards the end of my childhood till my mid-20s. I was in New Westminster, having finished middle school, part of elementary school, finished middle school, high school, and then went into university, Simon Fraser University in 2011 until Mm -hmm. 2017. After that, it's been, yeah, an interesting um, journey of like trying to figure out what do I want, looking at different situations as well, or taking that into consideration like the labor market, sort of the academic research theoretical skills that I'm coming out with, the practical skills from having done co-op, like trying to figure out how to piece everything together and see where my path is and like what direction I'm supposed to be heading towards. It took some time to really kind of navigate that in a way that I've been relocating from one city to another. I felt that metaphorically it feels the same way from sort of one career aspect to another. I I think everything just happens for a reason. You know, you can't force the process. There is timing for everybody and it's specific to everyone for a reason. And yes, you learn in hindsight what those reasons might be. You just have to have hope (laughs) and faith. (laughs) And you and I, we met in middle school, right? Yeah, 2003, four. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. It's been a long time. And we were in ADCAP together. And ADCAP was um, advisory career and personal planning. Something like that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then, then what else? We were in choir class together. We were, yeah, in vocal jazz from grades nine to 12. And I think you were in some musicals too, right? I I did Greece. I know I did okay. that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't do Greece, but I was there as background support. Okay. I don't know exactly what I did. I think I helped with like quick backstage costume changes. Yeah, I didn't want to participate in Greece in that in my last year. I was in Annie and Bye Bye Birdie, so that was in grade nine and. 
10. Yeah, Annie was the first musical in 2008 after such a long time, but it did set the stage for now uh, specific courses and programs in theater, right, that are being offered at yeah, NDUB. It's true. And I think what's really cool is that New West Secondary, we were just so fortunate to have our own theater attached to our high school and have such a talented music program that we yeah. could have our own pit band. And yeah. yeah, we also had just such a talented shop class that could like make all the sets for us that were like so professional we're a high school musical i remember reading some of the uh the local newspaper articles people writing into the editor just being like i was dragged out to go see a high school musical thought it was going to be so humdrum and boring and found out i was on my feet clapping after every number yeah it's kind of cool that we uh got to connect over that and meet during that time yeah And vocal jazz for sure. I mean, I think we saw each other, what, twice a week? Twice a week at like 6.30 a.m.? It was 7 o'clock, 7.30ish, yeah. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. (laughs) I I think it would have been really hard if it was 6.30 for us to get (laughs) You know what? I think it's just, I remember waking up at 6.30 every morning being like, oh, no. Yeah. (laughs) Why? But then realizing, oh, but it's it was all worth it, you know? Yeah, we have some really good choir chemistry, I would say. But we did connect over profound love and interest in music and in particularly uh, vocal jazz music. But we also explored other genres too. I think there was some like cultural pieces and some contemporary pieces too, right? Yeah. Thinking back, you know, I think everybody had their own unique voice, had their own unique style. But, you know, if we were to have lost a member, we would have definitely felt the impact as a group. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. everybody contributed in their own way that worked. Like it was just such a beautiful mix of voices and souls coming together. It was really profound. And I can only imagine like how that felt for Miss Prosnick. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I really did enjoy vocal jazz. It definitely contributed to part of my identity. And definitely as a teenager, you know, you go through some complex times. And and sometimes music was, for me, really predominantly the only form of expression that felt like it made sense. It was meaningful, non-judgmental. Like, it just felt like I could be myself. It felt free and it felt meaningful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, like, I feel like the vocal jazz class was like the springboard for my realization that I really do like to sing. (laughs) I mean, like, I felt like I belonged. I belonged in the subject of singing, if that makes any sense. You did Irish dance for such a long time, and I really considered myself as the Irish dancer of the group. But then you know I go into choir class and I'm like but I I'm also a singer I also sing and I can be two things at once if I want to be now it, it we've had a be, between high school and now we had a few years of a gap and you were going to university as you were saying and all that but I think it was it was essentially the pandemic that just I don't know I for me the pandemic was an opportunity for me to like record some songs and make some little videos to it and then I think you caught notice of some of them still like I'd come into Starbucks from time to time and you know whenever we saw each other we would chat a little bit right we'd Mm -hmm. always have a moment to catch up which was really nice but you're right I think the pandemic did really solidify a stronger connection it it was interesting because like after high school I don't really think though we've signed each other's yearbooks there was no pressure necessarily to like keep in touch and make summer plans blah 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 like it was just like okay we're done and you know we're out of here and celebrating the end of high school yeah and then we kind of already figured out our own individual paths but we also knew like life will bring people together and situations moments you just you don't know it's all untimed it's unique and that's what i really like too like just randomly i'd be popping in starbucks and there were days where you were working and uh, it was nice to catch up i also during um the pandemic i opened up a facebook account (laughs) i was so resistant to that for me i just for the longest time was having a internal conflict what is my relationship with social media you know it was still so foreign to me you know like we weren't necessarily brought up in a digital world to the extent that it is now embedded 
in toddlers upbringing what is this thing that people are getting all hyped up about like oh why do people want to show their pictures these issues just came to my mind mm -hmm. privacy issues the sense of like why do people want to be so vulnerable or what is it that they're trying to seek or what is it that they want does the sense of validation actually is it fulfilling like just a high that you're chasing a certain addiction you know and i was thinking like where am i in all of this also thinking at that time you know all these other aspects of me like being a colored woman and then also coming from a very traditional upbringing of being modest and very old school in some ways i just thought this was a, a little too extreme for me and i decided i'll take my time to wrap my head around all this and i know right now at times i'm not using it very responsibly i think i think i go a little bit crazy with it but you're fine but... don't worry <laughs> but um yeah you know i thought for me like if i ever decide i want to explore social media right i want to be able to use it to express my voice for things that matter humanitarian reasons and also to like support other people and give them a voice, something that's empowering and positive. And that's kind of what I want more than the show and tell of this is my life, you know, like that's great, but you know, maybe there's more that we can do, like it could be more mm -hmm. impactful, but that's just me. That's my preference. But uh, yeah, I was very much thinking like, I'll take my time, but because I decided I'll open up Facebook during the pandemic, it just made sense. You know, I, I needed to try and connect with people. There was a strong, innate, natural human need to start to find connections. I knew there were certain people that I would have, you know, happily liked to have added. And you were one of them for sure that popped up in my recommendations. So I, I saw that you had posted um, your own recordings with a cute little... <laughs> Pokemon of course. <laughs> visuals. And uh, so I was like, you know, I was really inspired that you had done that. And I, I liked the originality of it. And I thought you sounded really good. I mean, there were so certain songs that really stuck out for me, like your Sunday morning recording. Like, oh, I still love it to this day. Aw, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, and I was just like, oh my God, I need to connect with him. You know, like it brought back memories of vocal jazz. There was a commonality there. But uh, mm -hmm. I love that, you know, we have this open relationship where there's no pressures or uh, when we do connect, we really do make the most of our time together, uh, really talking in depth about personal topics, important things that matter to us, common values, beliefs, differences as well. But we do it in such a way that is so respectful, so healing, you know, so refreshing. And like you said, sometimes it's best to have lower expectations and just see where things go. And I really, I really like it. And I think it's working so far. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that. Like, I, I really, I agree that I, I, I enjoy that when I get to connect with someone who's willing to kind of see my soul and who's willing to sit with me in my darkness. Even though I'm still feeling darkness, that darkness turns into like a glimmer of joy. I'm not really good with small talk anymore. Like I just don't care for it too much. Mm -hmm. So to have people in my corner who are just willing to like go there with me, it means a lot. It really does. So I just uh, want to extend my gratitude to you and Oh. Thank you for that. So yeah, oh, absolutely. You're, you're welcome. I mean, I, I don't feel like I was really aware that I was helping you in, in those times. But I mean, even being able to reach out to you on WhatsApp, even though you hadn't really voiced what was going on. I know, you know, realistically, everyone has their ups and downs. And sometimes you just don't really need to necessarily talk about it or say what's going on. And especially over text, you know, you're not going to say that right like it just doesn't really make sense i mean already there's a layer of superficiality just by writing a bunch of words to each other right it's not the same as um, in person or even over zoom like at least we can see each other's faces right any opportunity to talk to anyone even without any context of what's going on especially people that are higher value individuals who genuinely care about a human connection more than anything they are not trying to uh, show face and like be someone else or make things complicated, wanting to be 
a good friend and a good person and I see that in you it just makes me even more like empathic and patient mm -hmm. and you know I just I don't feel any reason to question anything and I, I like that about our relationship so yeah I, I mean uh you're welcome thank <laughs> you hear that because yeah. there are times where I feel like I can be too too much you know like I could like send you a bunch of links and like okay get the hint like, <laughs> Uh, no, it's okay. It is all okay. I appreciate it because sometimes it's nice to know that someone's just like willing to like focus on you for a moment. Anyways, gushy moments. <laughs> um, love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, we don't talk um, about this. The Dear Brambling Podcast is an association with Sona Music. Do you have a guitar or a piano that's in your home right now that's just gathering dust? Have you always wanted to turn your shower singing skills into actual singing skills? Do you find yourself to be a musical person but just never had the opportunity to properly learn? Well, Sona Music is here to help. Sona Music offers a variety of different services as well as music lessons, live sound recording, as well as instrument repair. Its home base is in Clearwater, British Columbia, but we also provide online lessons to meet people where they're at wherever they are in the world. It is within Sona Music's mission and values to promote, nurture, and expand the art in the already flourishing and artistic community of Clearwater, British Columbia. Its mission is also to drive the next generation of skilled musicians and artists to their full potential. If you'd like to inquire about any services or lessons, please do so by visiting www.sonamusic.ca. Oh, hey there. Um, it's Luke here. Uh, before we continue with the rest of the conversation, I just wanted to take a moment to just acknowledge that uh, this is kind of a big deal conversation for me. We talk about some really important things, Minoji and I, and this whole week leading up to me finally posting it, I've been kind of a wreck. I do, however, just want to take a moment to say that this conversation couldn't have happened unless I had the guidance from my book called Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. And it pretty much guided me through the whole thing. Um, this is not a sponsor. This is not an association. This is not any type of commercial or whatsoever. This is more so just witnessing this book in action and how it can really help you and show how it really helped me. So yeah, just wanted to say thanks for the book, Brene. Yeah. So I want you to talk to me about that. What is identity? Like, what is identity to you? And yeah. <laughs> you know, I think firstly, identity is a very interesting, broad, yet can be very complex area of focus. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are studies done on what identity is, but you know, that's within different contexts, like identity in terms of sort of mental health identity in terms of just overall well-being, identity with the community, and then self-identity. I haven't really immersed in any kind of research prior to our discussion. It's also just as important in terms of like information gathering and sharing information. It's just as powerful as any sort of research that could be done, more or less. Also, I feel brave in saying this because the course that I'm taking right now, Gerontology 412, it's a special topics course. And yes, while it's rooted more so in flooring community engaged research that focuses on the well-being many social barriers and community related challenges that could also inform policy and decision making around healthy aging and just aging positively or most of the research is focused on older adults it really does relate to even us younger people i mean we're not getting any younger right we're not quite there yet we're not retirement age, but it is really interesting to learn how this research is intergenerational in a sense. And it focuses on like community engaged research. That means 
while you have multiple stakeholders, your participants, for example, the older folks, they are also co-researchers too. So they have a voice that's heard, they're seen, they are treated as equals. And there are a set of principles that not only advocate for inclusion and valuing each other's contributions, tacit knowledge, academic knowledge, business knowledge per se, but in really just understanding each other's point of views. And that has so much to do with your cultural background, your upbringing, your identity, essentially. So the fact that this kind of research really hones in on like being conscientious of each other's identity, the aspects that make up identity, maybe in some ways the fluidity that interplay in how people come together to tackle challenging questions, uh, research aims, and navigate some of the complexities of whatever the the situation is. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really interesting that this community-based participatory research really does essentially consider the identity of individuals and that in itself knowing that different perspectives are welcomed that they are seen as equally as valuable regardless of education background gender that identity is crucial that it needs to be acknowledged Mm -hmm. Uh, identity has so many links it can link to health and well-being community engagement and a sense of self and what that looks like so i mean there are different avenues to go into you're saying there it almost sounds like like identity is labels that we use to help identify ourselves and kind of help become one with ourselves yeah in a, in a way i think we have these labels to conceptualize what identity looks like and mm-hmm. feels like for us And in a way, identity is kind of like the bridge in terms of what our relationship is with the rest of the world. What you're saying is like identity is like a crucial part of our instinctual need for belonging. Yeah, for sure. For belonging, for connection. Identity is what either could be linked to privilege, it could be linked to oppression, it could be linked to personality as well, but essentially it really, if I were to summarize in a nutshell what it is, is that it is our relationship with ourselves and our environment. And that includes everyone around us globally. Wow, I kind of got shivers. Wow. (laughs) What it kind of sounds like you're saying is like, we have these labels that represent certain things and that there are other people in the world who maybe share some of those labels. Yeah, And that those people who share those labels can help better see us as who we are. I think you already said that, like, it's that bridge to connection, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, how I mentioned that identity is so broad and complex, Mm -hmm. it really is. You know, if I'm coming from a philosophical perspective, I think it really is our relationship and our experiences with ourselves internally and then externally with the world. Identity allows us to experience the world in the way that we can. And yes, there's gonna be overlap and commonalities. You know, like-minded people come together and they can talk about things. There's commonality there. So Mm -hmm. I think in a sense, there's also a sharedness in identity, but then there's also individual identity. What factors make you feel like you and how are they distinct? Like, how do they stand out from everyone else or do they? Maybe they don't have to. It's not a competition. And that's the other thing too. I think it's about striking a balance between what feels authentic and feels right for you versus what other people tell you you should feel and look and be like or think like. Also, there's that element of growth in realizing that uh, there's unfortunately so many layers of superficiality that get in the way of your happiness and what makes you feel like you are this person who is allowed to feel a certain emotion, who is allowed to have a certain experience with yourself and or the world, regardless of what people say or what the culture says. Identity, I think, is such a abstract concept. While we have labels, just to be able to picture and or process this and conceptualize it, it is really specific to an individual, his, her, their interactions with themselves in the world and the kind of relationships that are evoked from Mm. those interactions. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm surprising myself here as well. Your your whole spiel just made me think of this quote from this book I'm reading called Atlas of the Heart. And I was wondering, can I read you a quote from it? 
Yes, please. Okay. Um, True belonging is the spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. Having a deeper sense of belonging and connection to a larger humanity gives people more freedom to express their individuality without fear of jeopardizing belonging. Wow. Oh my God. Like, wow. I, I just feel that really encompasses what identity would look like or feel like or mean you know to to most people at least and um yeah. that was beautiful i really appreciate you reading out that quote um in fact when you do get a spare moment could you maybe send me a, a screenshot or a picture of that totally I'd love, to, I'd love to have that in my in my phone at least you know i can look at that and remind myself and i definitely think for sure identity is spiritual for sure there's a spiritual aspect to it that quote really embodied that very well Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, something that really stands out for me in that quote is true belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. Mm. I, I was just taking note of some of the things you're saying about what is socially acceptable. You know, do you think uh, a lot of times in our culture, we feel as though we need to like cut certain parts of ourselves away so that we can better belong, quote unquote, with this society. I do want to mention that I noticed that with kind of living in a digitized world, especially with social media as well, there's always this artificial standard of what physical beauty looks like. And there's an overemphasis on that, that people are more anxious about showing flaws. If you want to extend that outwards to other areas of what it means to be authentic or have a authentic human experience, even just going unscripted or feeling the need to have like everything, a speech perfectly written, edited right down to the T, you know, like everything. There's so much emphasis on things needing to be perfect or looking perfect. And that alone is so detrimental to people's well-being. It really shakes your core. And even if you don't want to admit it, you know, even though you're embedding and you're kind of riding this wave of, I want to say, deception mm -hmm. and, and betrayal to self, it does take away layers of originality and um, opportunities to work and exist in co-harmony. Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of dangerous mindset of having to conform to a certain way of thinking or a certain style, a certain appearance, a certain skin color or whatever, a certain standard that people are under the illusion of trying to achieve. It's a sort of suicide. It's internal rejection of what is natural and not being grateful for the differences that you have. You may not necessarily relate to um, the mainstream culture in some ways, and that could be, you know, ethnically different for you. There could be language barriers or differences in beliefs, upbringing. I don't think those should be treated as hindrances to belonging um, and to connection with people. And yet we do that, you know, yet society makes us think that if we think a certain way, just because we're not going to garner the likes or the attention of the majority that, oh, we are now low value, if you will, that we don't matter, that what we have to say is not as important, and that maybe, oh no, what if we're just outcasts thinking the wrong thing? I think this need to conform to certain standards, um, whether it's physical appearance for men and women and all the beautiful varieties of gender in between, whatever those standards may even be, if there are, I don't know. And cultural expectations of a woman of a certain background, what parents want or what the traditional aspects of culture want versus what this person internally wants or the Western aspects of it. I think I want to say that this need for perfection, this need to achieve a certain standard is a big problem. You know, ironically, people think that if we're more similar, we would have more in common, we would belong. But it's interesting that the focus or the emphasis on the superficial obviously doesn't translate to what connection is because connection is so deep it's it's beyond 
appearance and all these other superficial layers and and people don't get it the the main thing that i'm taken away from what you're saying is that there's a lot of violence in trying to fit in yeah yeah right like you use the word suicide which is like it's vi- very violent in itself and like I, I feel that sentiment because you're like yeah you're kind of killing a part of yourself just so you can fit in yeah. right yeah. and it's so ironic too because in our society we're constantly interchanging fitting in and belonging oh they belong therefore they fit in they fit in therefore they belong Mm -hmm. reality is is like fitting in is the opposite to belonging yeah because belonging is showing up as you are and that being enough for the group yes where fitting in is cutting a part of who you are away and hiding it Mm -hmm. so that the group can better accept you yes right and it's it's so violent in its nature if you really think about it but yet we do it all the time it's almost like it's counterfeit belonging like it's it's yeah fake 20 dollar bill that you're trying to pay for a coffee with right it's like oh my god yes exactly and we're, we're doing it because we're trying so much to gain the approval of the group just please like me i just want to be liked that too or on the other hand don't over criticize or don't be so critical when you're talking to me or thinking about me or god forbid you gossip about me you know there's that aspect too i think that also ties in perfectly with something i've been learning about belonging is that the experience the emotional experience of belonging is actually in a constant dance with the emotional experience of love you can't have love without belonging and you can't have belonging without love What's interesting is that if you try to show love without belonging, you'll have suffering. And if you try to show belonging without love, you're going to have more suffering. You have to have both. And if you don't, you know, there's going to be pain. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's crazy. The self-sabotaging that happens, the refusal to accept what is true and to foster or to adopt a sort of deceptive way of thinking because that's what society is doing. It's almost just like brainwash in a sense, kind of like following religion without understanding why you're doing it or does it even to you have any impact and in what way? Just kind of like blindly doing it just because everyone else is doing the same thing. Yeah. There is power in numbers. That's a big one. Yes. But at the same time, I think society has a huge responsibility in the traumas that have come about for young people, old people, anyone really. Mm -hmm. Somehow, in some way, shape or form, regardless of what generation you belong to, everyone has gone through some form of confinement in a way that has betrayed aspects of themselves and Mm -hmm. aspects that could have led to some genuine, healthy, vibrant connections. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's also... I think in a way nature embraces itself, right? Like there's the highs and lows, the beauty of nature, but there's also aspects of violence. Violence in a sense that there's evolution happening, changes for the better, hopefully, right? And I think, yes, we are also like that in a sense. There's Mm -hmm. altruism. We want to protect our children or whatnot. We want to carve out opportunities, do the best we can so they have a better future. Like that's all intrinsic human experience. But Unlike us, nature doesn't have these social constructs (laughs) of identity. (laughs) It doesn't say, wow, you know, you're this type of flower. Like, you know, it doesn't know that. I mean, in some sense, the obliviousness or or the lack of uh, awareness is kind of a blessing, if that makes sense. Yes, there will be competition. No one's going to live a happy utopia. Like nature isn't all so gorgeous at times we don't know what it's like to be flowers and we don't know what it's like to be insects and have to struggle on that level but what i'm trying to say is there are no social constructs and that makes it less complex okay i got another quote from atlas of the heart and i wanted to kind of lead into another thought the quote is um our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance what do you think about that Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our level of self-acceptance. So to me, when I read that, it tells me that like, I can't truly belong anywhere if I'm still in denial about parts of myself. I want to ask and like, 
I hope it's not too personal to ask, but like, have you ever experienced these types of things in your life? Yeah, definitely. I agree with the way you've interpreted this quote. And yes, I have. It's so true. You know, it really does all come down to self love and acceptance. Because if you don't accept and love yourself, and hopefully, if not 100% close to it, maybe 99%, I don't know, give or take, there will be days where you're like, why didn't I do this? Or this doesn't look good on me or whatever. But those are petty things. Hopefully, you know, we're talking about the more core values and and a sense of compassion and love and realizing that you're more than just those bad days or just unique opportunities where suddenly your ego is boosted or whatever. From a deeper sense, if you don't accept who you are, no matter how many fans you might have as a celebrity, no matter how many, how much attention you're getting, how successful you are in running a business, how wealthy you might be, how privileged you would be. If you haven't gone through certain discomforts and hurdles in life, you wouldn't really have a sense of self. You will never feel the need to question your identity per se. You know, you're like, oh, I, I I have all this wealth and status and I don't feel like my safety is threatened or my well-being, um, emotional well-being, physical well-being, whatever, you know, I I feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. When you feel fulfilled, I don't think you necessarily question whether you're a failure, whether you're successful, whether you've disappointed yourself or not. You don't really question, you don't really have a lot of internal dialogue. You're kind of on autopilot. You obviously love the luxury and the comfort that you get from that. But in having indulged in all these luxuries and not having gone through a lot of personal hardships, it doesn't necessarily mean you accept yourself. You may not even realize that you don't really know who you are. On the outside, you might be this person, royalty or celebrity, but on the inside, you're also kind of in dilemma. And then there may be situations that force you to face that dilemma and question of who am I and who do I want to be versus the perception that others have of me. Versus the impression I'm giving off to others. We all go through that. There's nobody, regardless of how wealthy you are, how privileged, how successful you are. There's no one who's never suffered, who's never not been disappointed in themselves, never felt any sort of oppression in some way or form. Mm -hmm. And um, encouraged when challenges do come up in life. And that's just how it is. That's normal to face and grow from it. Once we realize that we need to accept that certain things are out of our control and once we realize we need to take the opportunities to grow in um, uncomfortable or difficult unexpected circumstances and we realize and we embrace the the human experience that it can be yes both good and ugly Mm -hmm. then we start to develop more or less what a sense of identity is what what the sense of self is and self-worth and acceptance and then when we create that regardless of what anyone else in the world says whatever their opinion might be of you you know you wouldn't care even if it could be a compliment like you wouldn't take it so much to heart and, and if it's a negative comment, you wouldn't do the opposite where you start beating yourself over the head about these like horrible comments, you know? I think growth is important. And if you don't go through certain hurdles in life and you don't learn to grow from it in a way that you learn to love yourself through those challenges instead of engaging in escapism more so in a way that could be negative and harmful to, to yourself. And even if you realize that, It does take love. It does take self-love to really come out of maybe bad habits and vices and and redirect your attention to healing that inner wounds. It's almost like it's said and it's taken so casually. And that could be dangerous because like if you have low self-esteem and while other people, you know, whether they're genuine or not, they're complimenting you or critiquing you, how you engage with the comments, the compliments, the Um, negativity it really depends on you if you know who you are as a person you've gone through your challenges and uh, you've come out on the other end you know you're a survivor and you have moments of disappointment where you learn to still love yourself through that you do belong in some way shape or form like you would stand alone as a beacon of light to others and they will gravitate to you You don't need to go finding people. They will just naturally want to come to you, you know? And that's not everybody, but that's that's also a good thing. You kind of want to filter out the people that you don't need in your life. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> so you want, obviously, you will attract then hopefully good people, like-minded people who've gone through sort of similar situations or feel the same way about what it means to have self-value or self-worth and to accept yourself. Because yes, essentially, no matter who you have, have in your life, who's by your side, things change, right? Circumstances change, people can leave. And, you know, if you have a strong sense of self, you won't blame yourself in a sense, or you won't think that you are the issue. You just understand that this is the ebb and flow of life and yes you all you'll own up to your mistakes hopefully you wouldn't really have a big ego <laughs> i mean otherwise if you do you're you don't really love yourself i think you just love the persona of you oh wow that's well said well hold on hold on hold on say that one more time well that, that last bit <laughs> yeah that last bit just say that yeah. one more time i need that to sink in for a moment <laughs> so it was about the ego yeah it was about the ego i so if you have an ego and, and that's the priority for you, you don't necessarily love yourself. You don't know who you are. You just love the persona of, of that, e what that ego um, represents. Yeah. Wow. That is well said. Wow. That kind of, <laughs> I don't know. It's some, like, sometimes you hear things over and over again in that sort of way and you kind of like intrinsically know but then someone words it in a way that somehow just kind of hits, hits a chord, hits a string that just like makes you resonate a little bit. Ooh, thank you. Wow. Oh, <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm just going to need a minute to recap there. So what she said at the end there was that if you have a big ego, you're not necessarily in love with yourself, or you're not showing love to yourself. You're more so in love with the persona. Right? That's what she said, right? That, wow. Wow, that's, that's a, well, okay, I'm going to be carrying that in the, my back pocket for, I don't know, the rest of my life. Like, that's... That is huge. I just wanted to um, take this minute to thank Minoji for coming onto this podcast and talking about this really complicated and nuanced topic with me. It is really clear that she has a lot of passion and knowledge on this topic, and I'm just, I'm so grateful that she agreed to be on the podcast with me. Now, in the next part of this episode, Minoji and I are going to be jumping into language and how that ties in with identity. I personally do think that, you know, belonging is a function of identity. However, language is more so the container that you can put it in, you know? It really just uh, helps you see it, hold it, um, and uh, take better inventory of it, and it doesn't get everywhere. It doesn't get you all wet and soggy and grossed. You know what I mean? Language is just so important. Also, in the next uh, part of this episode, I think I'm going to be uh, revealing a part of my identity that I haven't really told many people, um, and I'm a little scared, and uh, I'm going to be brave, and I'm just going to get it out there and um, use it as a, as a great example for talking about identity. Also, to those who might be listening, I wanted to maybe uh, check in with you, and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, are you feeling like you belong where you're at, or are you fitting in? You know, is there love in the uh, group of people that you feel like you might belong to? Is there uh, an absence of love? Is there an absence of belonging? You know, are you suffering right now? Um, you know, and what sort of things are you going to be doing from now on to make sure that you feel more like you belong? You know, these are some really hard questions. And I think these are some of the questions that we need to be asking yourself if we want to start putting in the work on becoming better people, you know? So, you know, do you belong or do you fit in? Where are you at?
The Dear Brambling Podcast is a podcast dedicated to my little nephew, to the next generation of humans growing up in this world, as well as to those who might be looking for a little more guidance in their life. It is hosted by me, Luke Benoit. The editing and sound design are provided by MB Productions, as well as Hideout Productions. The music that you're listening to is called Sunlight Cascading Through the Clouds by Artificial Music. If you'd like to follow me on any social media, I am on Instagram and Twitch at Lucatronosaurus Rex. And for those who are still listening this far into the podcast, I'd like to take a moment to really thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'd also like to say that if you are experiencing any difficulties or pain in your life right now, there is still no substitute for a trained coach, counselor, or licensed therapist. If you are committed to putting in the work and really trying to better yourself as a human, I definitely recommend that you go searching and shopping for the right coach, counselor, or therapist for you. 